talent is just some magical pixie dust ridden in on a unicorn that people right. expect to be dropped on them somehow. You get your dopamine from the continuous progress rather than just the result of it. The process of deliberate practice, we were talking about earlier, and I'll elaborate a little bit now, creates flow. Flow creates passion. Mistakes are simply pieces of information. Why do they make you upset? Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Strength Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Krakowski. I'm so grateful for you to join me today. So today, I have the learning coach on the podcast. Yes, Greg Goodhart joins me on the show all the way from LA. Greg is an expert in the aspect of learning, which has always been a fascinating topic to me. It's the process of how we learn something on a foundational level and the ability to learn how to learn better is a skill I believe we all can do and improve on. And Greg dives into some great detail in this conversation. Just a few topics that we talked about is the way we learn, how talent is overrated, how to actually learn how to learn better and what deliberate practice actually is. So I learned so much on this podcast from Greg. He has a great way of articulating this topic and I know you'll get a lot out of it. All right, so I hope you like the show. If you like it, please take a moment to give a review. Make sure to subscribe so you can catch all new episodes that drop every single week here. Help spread that message of strength for me. All right, thank you very much. Now let's get on with the show. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And Greg, it's so nice to meet you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, so everybody, I'm with Greg Goodhart, aka The Learning Coach. I was just talking off air with you, like this just topic of actually learning, I think is such a fun thing to dive into, because it's really the foundation of everything, you know, and in the work that you had that I got a chance to dive into, you had a quote I want to start it with here is how successful we want to be at anything we want to do in life is determined almost entirely by how well we learn to do that thing. I'm like, that just, that nails it so much on the head. And we were talking about like, whether you're just getting started or whether you want to be a master of something, it still comes back to the concept of how you learn. And this is where a lot of the work that you've done and, you know, brought in, got into the details behind this, I found it so fascinating. So uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Again, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. It's, yeah. it's awesome. I, I, after talking to you for 10 minutes before we did this, this is going to be fun. Yeah. So how did you kind of get into this world of learning? I know there's a lot that goes into, I mean, there's the neuroscience side of it. There's also kind of the aspect of, of practice. Like how did you kind of get yourself into, into this work field? Well, I decided at a young age that I wanted to be a musician and I quickly found out that I didn't have a lot of talent. Mm. Um, Though it looked like it in the beginning, because I had already played violin and trumpet in grade school. So when I started playing guitar, it looked like I was talented. And to save a, a long story, I ended up through a very circuitous route, um, getting a master's degree in music. And uh, started out in rock and roll and then figured, I'm not getting good enough here. Maybe these classical guys know something. So I took classical guitar in college and then got an opportunity to get a, a free master's degree, basically, mm-hmm. and just kept going and doing that. And then I did, you know, what everyone does. I got a job and I I started working um, at a private school because I do not have a teaching credential. Um, And I started a little classical guitar program and it was great. The first part was a struggle. It was so much fun every year. My, my, my most indelible memory from the first year is walking into the faculty lounge. I can still see the door in front of me. And it was the first week of school. I said, I cannot wait till the first week of school next year. I cannot wait because I have so many things I need to tell people before they even walk into my classroom because mm. everyone was showing up with all kinds of different guitars and everything. And here's what happened. Um, over time, took several years, I was able to get my, I, I, I figured out what worked. I was the very first thing was figuring out how to get people to practice. Um, mm. that's, that's a tough one. And I think any getting started on anything should work the same way. You don't send someone home and say, practice a half hour a day. You work on getting started. It's called orienting selective attention. Mm. And so I, I, I went through that process and then, <laughs> and then I realized, oh my goodness, they're getting so good. They need to learn things. I don't know how to do. I, I, wow. I can't, you know, tear up my instrument. I was always chasing this talent or something like, and I kind of had an idea that talent wasn't what what it was about, but I kept trying and trying and I'd find different things. And like a lot of people who find them like contextual interference is is one technique where you do something, but you do it differently. Like you do it a sequence backwards or something, Mm -hmm. which, which makes you look like you're not learning at all, but 
within a day or well, actually within a day or two in certain situations within minutes, you can get better at what you're doing, even if you struggled with it for a long time. So I found these things, but it doesn't work unless you understand the whole way it works. It won't work mm. anymore once you get good at it. The whole idea is the struggle, but I digress. So I found a few of these things, started teaching them to my students, realized, oh my goodness, I can't get them to where I want them to be able to audition into any music program in the country. Mm -hmm. And how do I get them there? I haven't been able to get myself there. I had stage fright. I had all sorts of problems. And in many cases, and certainly in my case, nervousness didn't cause my stage. I'm, I'm sorry, lack of uh, my stage fright was not caused by nervousness. It was caused by lack of ability. Mm. And I thought it was the other way around. I thought it was the nervousness that was causing my problems. And so I started to find answers and it took me five years. It was a five year investigation and, and I had the greatest gift. I had classes full of students to experiment with. Okay. Yep. I never did anything that would take them backwards. It was always on top of whatever I was doing, but mm -hmm. I started to learn all the things that would take them forwards. It was a great lab. Um, I taught at a high school in Anaheim called Servite for 13 years. Mm -hmm. and built a built a music program there and first five years was figuring out the talent mystery i figured okay. it would be unfair to take people into a beginning music class and uh expect the same thing out of both the untalented and talented students so i did everything i could to find talent for five years everything i could and mm -hmm. i finally was smacked in the face by the realization it has nothing to do with talent. Talent is just some magical pixie dust ridden in on a unicorn that people right. expect to be dropped on them somehow. And mm -hmm. everyone who got good did the work properly. People who had advantages in the beginning had some other sort of related training previous to it. And many times you don't even know what that is. There's just mm -hmm. a little here or a little there. Um, you know, for, for instance, you could... If if you took your baseball swing seriously and never played tennis in your life, your first tennis lesson, you're probably going to look talented because you can control your arm better. For right. Yeah. Playing. You have a little reference point to it. Right. And there's all sorts of these little things that we do that we don't realize prepare us. So after five years, I realized, OK, it's not the talent thing. Now, what do I need to do? And like a lot of teachers, like a lot of people who teach people, I um, and when I I don't just mean teachers in the system, I mean, anybody. Um, I said, okay, well, what do I need to do? And I started to come across things that worked, the contextual interference thing, little things, but I wasn't able to use them to their full effectiveness. They would all kind of hit a wall and you think, well, maybe it doesn't work that good, or maybe it works here. I look mm. back at some of the things I was doing as I approached my 10th year of teaching there, um, or my, my 13th after I, which is after that I left. And I say, boy, I thought I was really slick doing yeah. these exercises and things. And oh my gosh, if I only knew how it worked. So that was the struggle for my second five years. If talent really isn't a factor, then what should I do? What is it that people do just to get to the next level? And then can, cause mastery is just mm -hmm. simply getting to the next level one at a time. Right. And my turning point was reading a book called talent is overrated by mm -hmm. Jeff Colvin mm -hmm. in 2010. And the only reason I got it is because I thought it would give me some ammunition in parent meetings. Because there'd always be those, every year or two, there'd be a couple of kids who just would not do their work and they're going to get poor grades. And the argument the parents made in our parent meetings were was, well, he just doesn't have musical talent. Right. And so I, 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 and so I said, okay, in this book, I'll find some, oh my gosh, it blew my mind. It was like all of a sudden, all the things I had been working on, all the techniques is, that I had been getting together mm -hmm. Uh, were kind of described and uh, elucidated on in this book. And that's when I started the research. I wanted to recommend, I was at that point, I was a department chair and had hired a couple of people, a choir director, a band director. And I wanted them to read this book, but I wanted to make sure I hadn't fa fallen for a well-written book that wasn't. Right. So I started reading the science and I'm embarrassed to admit, especially now that I'm Mr. <laughs> I've read the science guy, I went to the deliberate practice study, which we all, that's where the 10,000 hour rule is supposed to come from. Right. If anyone's read up on this, there's no real 10,000 hour rule. That was a fabrication mm -hmm. by Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. That has some fact. And anyway, so I, it took me two weeks to read the study. Two weeks. I, I would go back in terms I didn't understand, but I, I and, and the, the problem, the wonderful thing was 
I'm like, I don't understand this until I read this and this study that uh, upon which it's based. And then I'd read those. Well, I need to read this and this and this. And then I need to read this book. Mm-hmm. But I got far enough that I was able to recommend the book, uh, which was very helpful to the people uh, in my department. And that's what started it. And, I, and it was just like, it was like being a kid in a candy store. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, every time I read something new or find something new about this, I can get my students better and better. And I always experimented on myself first in my practice. All of a sudden, my stage fright went away because I could actually do everything that I wanted to do. Right. And so that's it's so interesting. Kind of staying on that that topic of talent, I think that's always interesting, right? You know, because I mean, and that is a sexy uh, you know title right there. Talent is overrated. Like if you're in this world, you're going to jump on and read that book. And I was, I've always been fascinated by that because, you know, some, you know, growing up in athletics and stuff like that, some kids seem like they naturally drifted towards that. And you think that that's talent. And I didn't know if like, maybe they're just more interested in it. So they put more deliberate practice in right away. Like what can be created. Mm, Oh, oh, can you elaborate on that? Of course. Yeah. Uh, The process of deliberate practice we were were talking about earlier, and I'll elaborate a little bit now, creates flow. Flow creates passion. Before even flow, just being able to do something that you couldn't do before is like, well, I want to say like a drug. It produces dopamine in the brain. There's a study by a guy named Barry Zimmerman, which uh, he studied uh, two groups. He, he took he took a bunch of women and split them into two groups in uh, England uh, to learn how to play darts. And one group just was allowed to randomly have a good time and play darts and figure it out. The other group was given specific instructions and deliberate practice and how to get better. The people who got better wanted to do more of it. The people who didn't, like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't care. And that's it. It's the human brain loves accomplishment. And it loves little bits of accomplishment. And we've made a big mistake in the way we teach people. Patting someone on the back and saying, good job, when you didn't do a good job, doesn't work. And in fact, it does damage. Mm. You know better. Can't tell you how many kids get on stage and perform and people say, and it wasn't that good. And people say, but we love you anyway. And, oh, it was fine. Right. We just thought it was one. You know, okay, that's that's fine too. But it didn't sound good. And if you'd like right. it to sound good, these are the things we need to do. Right. And so uh, this whole idea of, and in fact, I really think I, I don't want to say I proved it because it's not science, But I was at an all boys Catholic school for 13 years Mm -hmm. um, teaching high school. And I taught a classical guitar class, not rock and roll, not Eddie Van Halen, not any of that stuff. We talked a little bit about that stuff. That's my history playing that when I was younger. Um, Now, how do you get high school boys into playing classical music on a nylon string guitar? And what I did with now at that time, I just basically forced them to practice. I know there's a better way now right. to, them to do little teeny bits of accomplishment, but I would have kids who would come in and their parents would read me the riot act. He's, you know, why is he doing poorly in your class? He's trying. I'm like, he's not following directions. And then when mm-hmm. the kid would realize, geez, I should just follow directions. I had kids go from that to going to uh, scholarships and music programs, because once you mm-hmm. start to get good, it feels good. That's the thing that feels good. And I'm really, um, let me use the word circumspect about this whole idea is just keep, I read a book recently, keep trying stuff until you find what you're good at. Until All you're finding is something that you can get better at. That's Mm -hmm. what makes you feel good about it. It, Honestly, the subject doesn't matter. You can get better Mm -hmm. at basket weaving and you would start to like basket weaving. Yeah. How the heck I ended up being reading science and doing all this stuff. Music was my passion, but you know why it died out? Cause I didn't get good enough at it. Yeah. That that's a really interesting uh, perspective there. And if you think about it, it is, it's like just progress and seeing like, okay, I'm seeing progress. I was here. I was shitty. Now I'm crappy. Now I'm good. And like, whatever and you do, you do the smallest increments. Yeah. And it's like, maybe it might not be the thing that lights you up as far as total interest of it, but you can see passion. I think when you break it back down to the foundation of actually learning, like you can learn to basket weave and it might not be your next career that you're doing, but getting better at it 
it shows you that you can follow directions that you can actually apply it and you can get better. And the brain releases dopamine when that happens. Yes. Yes. And it loves it. And it makes you want to do more. Mm -hmm. This is where championship basket weavers come from, by the way. <laughs> so on that, uh, kind of keeping it with kind of the younger kids and stuff like every we. I mean, there's all the talk now about the participation trophies and all that type of stuff. And we all know the the detriment that that comes in. We're actually the ones that actually won. It diminishes their accomplishment. And the ones that didn't do well, they actually feel embarrassed by it because they know that and it they offers didn't, no incentive. Yeah, they didn't do well at all there. Um, and it seems like people just maybe want to be compassion, you know, compassion about cool. it. They don't want kids to feel cool. bad and stuff. But still, we <laughs> so kind of what is the is there a solution to that? Like, you don't want a kid to like, you don't say like you suck, you know, to them and make them feel bad, but you want to provide encouragement. So when you were doing teaching and you found this, what was kind of the way that you kind of gave them, I guess, constructive criticism is the, is the right approach to it? Something I came to find was called mindset. We've heard of growth mm -hmm. mindset and fixed mindset. Carol Dweck out of Stanford, 30 plus years of research on this growth mindset, fixed mindset thing. I do recommend her book, Mindset. I believe it came out in 2007. Mm -hmm. I, caveat, I do understand that it has come under fire in the replication crisis. I have read some of the criticisms. We could go on to a, spend an hour talking about how that works, but let me just say, read Mindset and take it to heart mm -hmm. and, and go from there. So, one of the foundational principles of mindset is, and this uh, Mimi Zweig, who's a world-renowned violin teacher at Indiana State University, Bloomington, um, says, mistakes are simply pieces of information. Why do they make you upset? So the way I started doing, in fact, what I do now is uh, I coach people, mostly musicians, but I do academics as well. Um, and when they come in, they, they have a saxophone. I don't know how to play saxophone. They have a saxophone teacher. The problem is, is we send kids home to do their work on their own to figure out how all that part works. We give them content. We don't give them process. And mm. so when a kid shows up to a lesson with me, even this is how I kind of ended my guitar teaching career. The, the bridge to that was, well, when something went wrong, I said, huh, that went wrong, didn't it? Yep. What's the problem? Uh, well, I, I just seem to really screw it up. Does that usually happen at home? It does. What have you tried? I've tried this, this, and this. Okay, let's find some other strategies. There is always, always, always a mm. solution. Always a solution. Other than that, other if it's, I don't know, just keep trying, which I used to say. Just keep doing this. Just keep at it. And at some point, you'll break through. One of the reasons for that is because mask repetition doesn't work. And we keep doing repetitions, repetitions. Right. That's, that's something different. Um, but the idea that you need to get kids, you you sell them on the idea. And I, I, and I would sell my entire classroom on this idea. If you do something wrong, why are you upset and hearing that you did it wrong? Does this make any sense <laughs> at all? If you want to get better at something... Would you rather know? I have a, I have interesting stories about this because um, a lot of times I'll start with some very experienced. I have a particular memory of someone who's auditioning for high level orchestras and things like that over in Europe. And I was coaching this person. <laughs> Once I showed her what was going on, she became, and this happens more than a little, she became upset. I've wasted so much time. You know, all this time I spent practicing what, oh, I can't believe what I've done to myself. And I say two things to these people. The first is, would you rather not know? Could you just right. rather keep doing it the same way? And the second is, if you'd rather know, when? Today? Tomorrow? Next right. week? And you start to make sense to people. How are you going to get better at something if you don't know what's wrong? There's a difference between an insult and constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. know, know the difference. But constructive criticism is an insult, and it's a complete shift in the way we look at learning. It's okay to be told you did something wrong. It's okay to walk off stage and go, I didn't do a good job. I need yeah. to do better. But if you do this all the right way, your experiences on stage are going to be pleasant for yeah. the most part. But that's it. You and, and there's so much more to it than just what I'm saying. If you read Mindset, it becomes, I even have a document, How to Teach Mindset, it's part of a, a book I wrote. Uh, you have to, like, for instance, one thing before I ever heard about Mindset, one thing I would do frequently after I finally figured out the talent thing is when someone would play well, 
I'd say, hey, that's great. You worked and you got it. You followed directions. Hey, everyone else in class, anyone can do this. If you want to do it, you do it. In fact, I used to give out. This will make me sound like an ogre. But every once in a while, I had to fail somebody. And I used <laughs> to call these happy Fs because the person would sit and, and play their thing and no one failed out of the blue. They knew it was coming. like, come on, weeks in advance. Let me help you come after school. You're just mm-hmm. not following directions. And, and, and when they get done, I say, you know why you failed, right? And they say, yeah, I didn't do the work as assigned. That is a great thing. Failure is yeah. such a small thing. Failing a, a, a class or something like that is very small in your entire life. But if you walk out with the knowledge that I could have done as well as I wanted, there's nothing wrong with me. Yes. I, I could have done as well as I wanted. I chose not to. Yeah. And just that, you know, that acknowledgement of once you do that too, and you realize that it doesn't break you and you still walk out of the room and you're still okay and stuff. It's funny when you were talking uh, there, Greg, I think it's, was it Roger Waters from Pink Floyd after every concert that he did? And I mean, he's been selling out arenas for what, three decades or so. He goes back to the room, gets some food and watches the playback to see what went well, what can go better. And it's just like, it's that concept. Okay, we know we're doing well. And it's Pink Floyd, they can rest on their laurels if they want to. But it's that adoption of understanding that it's the process that you fall in love with, you get your dopamine from the continuous progress rather than just the result of it. I think if you it seems like if you learn that at an early age of that's really the yes, the ultimate reward, then that's going to be in anything that you do. Yes. And let's be clear, it doesn't feel good. It's okay to not feel good sometimes. Okay. I've experienced this myself many times when I turn, I, I, I've coached a certain way for a couple of years back in the beginning. And then when I finally found retrieval practice and realized the mass repetition that I was assigning wasn't the right thing to do, it hurt. I, why have I been telling people this? I'm this great coach and I can get people, but was it the right thing to do? So I experimented with it. And I'll tell you, I took too long to adopt it in full because it hurt. (laughs) because I took it and and even though I knew I was kind of doing that it was really hard to work past that so that's the thing go ahead and feel it Mm -hmm. understand what it is it's a relatively meaningless human condition that Mm -hmm. somehow gets upset when you find out you didn't do something correctly right I don't understand where this comes from I I think it might be cultural sure why why and this is part of the pernicious belief in talent. Well, if I do it wrong, I don't have talent for that. Mm. And so I should give up. No, if you do it wrong, you're probably learning. And does it mean that tomorrow you're going to be a professional? If the person who does nine out of 10 things right, they're probably closer to being a professional than you who's doing five out of 10 things right. Well, all you got to do is get the other four things right. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I wonder sometimes too how much of that is ex- expectations at the beginning of trying something as well. Like oh. we were talking, like we were talking about Mozart before. You know, and some people are like, well, I don't want to be Mozart or so. It's like, well, but you can get better at music and actually actually be like really enjoyable. You know, you can you know be a you, you be a pianist. You can have a band or so. I mean, if that's what you want to do, it's the same that I see in health and fitness. It's like, yeah, maybe you don't want to jump on stage or do like some crazy competition, but you can get healthier. It all comes back to learning the same systems. And then once you get to a certain level, maybe you need to change some stuff, but the foundation of actually how to learn it, it seems like it's the same regardless of, of the talent or the, or the level that you're at. It is. It totally is. And the fact that we encourage people that show a little bit of extra ability in the beginning and then kind of leave others out, it's really damaging. Yeah. Well, that was one of my favorite uh, stories I remember from Kobe Bryant that he talked about when he was younger, um, where he would play in summer basketball. And he was already one of the best hundred in the in the country in high school. But he was younger and there was a bunch of guys ahead of him and they would go play summer ball. And he decided that he would he played the entire summer with just his left hand because hmm. he knew that he could work well on his right hand. But he just worked on his left hand where all these other guys they stayed in the lane of what they were really good at because they wanted to score a lot of points. He didn't give a what? shit. He didn't give a shit how many points he scored in summer. He just wanted to get better at his left hand. So all of a sudden he started to get to a next level of ability 
And it wasn't just his sheer talent. No, he had a process of how he was learning it. He was like, okay, I can be shitty and not be the best player in the stat, in the stat sheet in summer AAU, but I'm going to get better at this. So that's, that's right into mindset again. Mm. And Dweck did a study or some or several studies in which they gave uh, puzzles that were moderate, moderately difficult to two groups of kids. And they both saw, with some effort, both solved the puzzle. One group was told, man, you're really talented. That's amazing. You're so good at that. Another group was told, you worked hard for that. Good for you. You figured it out. When given an opportunity to do more difficult puzzles, the ta- less people in the talent group wanted to take the challenge. More people in the work group wanted to take the challenge. And the reason was because the people in the talent group didn't want to jeopardize their designation as talented in front of their peers. Mm. And we do so much to cover up our weaknesses, whether it's at an athletic practice or anywhere else, to cover up our weaknesses to seem good that only gets in our way. It's those, like you talk about Kobe Bryant, I believe they called it the Mamba mentality, or if you read about Michael Jordan and how he does that, of course, that's what it is. Or Mia Hamm, how she always used to push herself up to the next level of competition and suck and, and, and get better. That's what it takes. But it doesn't feel like that, and culture doesn't tell us that, because if we have talent, we'll show some um ability there and if we don't show natural ability we should try something else and that is completely wrong Mm. so how is it that what how much emphasis is it to especially even like going with uh young kids but this is you know i think deals so much with adults too of the process of how you learn it's like i know some people are are visual some are auditory some learn do you believe in kind of that theory of it or do you think it is more universal that everybody can can learn in a similar process. I should be careful here. Sure. Um, you're talking about learning styles. Mm-hmm. And when asked about these by a teacher or somewhere, I say, well, what learning styles do you believe in? How many are there? Right? And I don't know, um, six, seven? Well, there's been 81 identified somewhere along the lines mm-hmm. of 81 by uh, companies that will charge your school tens of thousands of dollars to come in and evaluate what your learning styles are. Here is the conclusion so far on learning styles and learning differently. There is no evidence that it actually works. Mm -hmm. And and it may work. We have to say that. We have to say, well, there's no evidence against it. There's no evidence for it. Okay. But we should not be devoting resources to it if we're not sure that it works. Having said that, when I hear about things about learning stuff, I'm going to get myself in so much trouble. stuff. (laughs) When I, when I hear about learning styles, people say, well, I know how, how to tell someone's learning style. I'll first present it in this way, and then in this way, and then in this way, and then they get it. That's their learning style. Maybe they just needed to hear it three times. Mm. And the other thing is, if you read, because I have read a, a, a bunch, because there's, and the other thing is, is there's no real central clearinghouse on learning styles, like deliberate practice, Erickson. Uh, yes. retrieval practice, Bjork and Rodiger. And you know, there's no central clearinghouse. What people will say is, um, oh my gosh, why can't I remember the guy's name? Um, multiple intelligences. Okay, The idea of multiple, mm-hmm. that you have, can have a mathematical intelligence, that has its own problems. But even he wrote an article about, this is not learning styles. It's totally mm-hmm. different. Yet people keep referring to that researcher. And I just can't remember the name off the top of my head who wrote the, the book, learning um, uh, multiple intelligences. Mm-hmm. And this this is the thing, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought a little bit because I was talking about, um, oh, the whole idea of learning styles and what they are. Mm-hmm. Well, if you try a bunch of different things, you're actually participating in contextual interference. That is doing something, for instance, there's studies, and this is, I, I, if you go find online my a video called, what is a practice class? You can see me doing this with musicians where stuff they'd been struggling with and struggling with for weeks or months, had a concert, it all fell apart, we fix in 20 minutes. And the way I usually do this is introducing them to one powerful thing in learning, contextual interference. That is doing the same thing in a new context. There's one study, and I should point out, to quote Paul Kirshner, the researcher on Twitter, one study is just one study. Just because yes. it's a study doesn't mean it's true. But when you combine it with experience, with reading other things around that and everything else. So just because someone says on Facebook there's a study 
doesn't. Yes. <laughs> doesn't you, you have to have it as part of a whole suite of things that you're studying if you're passionate about learning that stuff. And so contextual interference, there was a study that showed, um, and he's done a bunch more stuff. This is Robert and Elizabeth Bjork at UCLA, that if you took two students and one studied for a math test in one room and one studied for a math test in two different rooms, the two different rooms consistently got a better grade. By simply varying the context, I believe what this does is it causes you to focus more because you're in a new environment. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. do it even you can do it even better on an instrument by doing something in a different rhythm. Matter of fact, if you're a wide receiver on a football team and you really want to get your route running down crisp, try doing it not one at a time going duh, duh, duh. Yeah. Da, da. Try running it that way. Then try backwards. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Then try running the whole thing backwards. Mm -hmm. And you'll suck at it. It'll be terrible. And in a day, you'll be a lot better. So when people talk about learning styles, like, weren't you just performing contextual interference? Weren't you just having them learn the same thing in several different ways? Right. No wonder they finally got it. So, so yeah, there's... Yeah. The That's learning styles thing has been really overblown. And what they say in the literature mm -hmm. is, well, what you should do is you should address everyone in the class, meaning you should teach it in several different ways. Right. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I think you broke it down there saying it's like, oh, you did it this way, this way, this way. It's like, well, maybe the person just needed to hear it three times and they were listening. So it kind of comes back to that deliberate practice. And it's like, yeah, maybe there is some merit to it. It seems like it might be more the micro rather than the macro. It's kind of like that, you know, it's that uh, philosophy of, you know, all problems are very complicated, but solutions are often very simple. It's yeah. like, we can that all like say, reason, right? exactly. Like why you got to this stage in your life, it could be a million different reasons and it could be the same other person. You still both need to do the same thing in order to solve it. That's right. And pro yeah. So, so getting into that concept of deliberate practice, cause I think this is really, you know, big. And I've seen this a lot in the work that I do with kettlebell training, which is a lot of it say, you know, we don't practice, we don't train or work out, you practice, you know, it's like working on that. But the way that you broke it down, I thought was interesting of that deliberate practice doesn't mean that it's like, it's fun. <laughs> like it's actually kind of, you're approaching it like work uh, from there. So, but that seems like, is that the kind of the, the main point behind how to learn anything is just that deliberate practice? Well, yes, but deliberate practice demands that you find the best practices. You mm -hmm. would find mindset, you'd find contextual interference, you'd find retrieval practice. But my favorite line from the 1993 study, which for those of you who want to read it or understand it, it's just a starting point. Oh, if there's something wrong with it, then it means deliberate practice isn't real. No, that was just a starting point. They were beginning to discover something. Mm -hmm. uh, a line in there that says deliberate practice is not inherently enjoyable. I love that line. Yeah, that's a great not, line. Now, when it starts to create flow, it's a little bit different. But once you start to get into that, that's fine for the thing you're doing. Then you want to find the next thing that makes you uncomfortable. And the way you do that is this. It's do a plan virtuous triangle plan. To, so you're doing something with kettleballs and mm -hmm. you want someone to improve in a certain area. This person would be best served by doing whatever it is they should do, mm -hmm. reflecting upon what they just did. We'll get back to this in a second. Mm -hmm. Reflecting upon what they just did and then letting that affect a plan, which they will then do. Then they will reflect upon that and they will make a plan. I got a funny story about this, by the way. Sure. This is um, basically a really stripped down version of Erickson's research. And I was going to Florida State University where he was a professor at the time. He, he died about a year and a half ago. It was a a lovely man. He was a great guy. I know this because I finally got up the courage to email him right before I got to Florida State and was doing all my presentations in the in the music program. And he showed up at one of my uh, presentations, mm -hmm. you know, relatively small classroom, like 30 people in it. He's sitting in the back, thrilled to meet the guy, gave me a signed copy of his book. Just sweet, sweet, wonderful guy. And I'm about to click this slide and I realize I've never run it by him. Like, like oh, this wow. is my <laughs> abject fear standing there with him, the man yeah. looking at me. I'm like, uh oh. And I had no choice. I had to just go through with the, I should, 
I never thought he'd respond to my email, so I probably should have sent it to him. Anyway, he was cool with it. He was fine with it. Oh, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure he's just like, absolutely. Use it in anything. You know, the more, you know, usually people like that, they're like, yeah, send it out as much as possible. So that was great. So, so far, I'm, I, I, you can find all sorts of different versions of this, but mm -hmm. I think I'm the first person who ever connected it up with deliberate practice and how that works. Mm -hmm. This reflecting metacognition, thinking about our thinking while we're doing it, requires an amazing amount of mental energy. Not only that, but it requires even more mental energy because remember when we were talking about mindset, this requires being honest with yourself and giving yourself that very critique that you don't like getting from others, mm. which is tough to do. You have to be in love with the improvement process that happens in here. Most people do this. They just keep doing stuff over and over and hoping they'll, it, maybe talent will kiss them at some point and they'll get better at it. Mm -hmm. This is the difference. And you actually have to teach this. And it's not, a, and here's another thing when you teach something, it's not enough to do it once. You have to do it over and over and over again and continue to refine the ability. Mm -hmm. And this teaching, this reflect piece takes about 10 minutes for people to mm -hmm. do and start to realize. And they will, there's a great book called Make It Stick, all about using retrieval practice and everything else. If you prove to people, that a certain study technique works that's totally different than the study techniques they're used to, they will be thrilled with the results and then go back to their old way mm. and abandon it. It's whatever feels good in the moment, whatever feels better. You have to condition people to this. I would, I would imagine, and, and I, I've been lifting weights for 30 years, I would imagine it's a, it's a lot like lifting weights. You just have to keep doing it over and over, checking your form, uh, mm -hmm. reading up on stuff, making sure you're doing the right exercises, being open to the fact that you may be doing something that's going to hurt you. And when you learn something, you can change what you're doing. That sure. sort of stuff. Yeah. It's uh, the, the analogy I used was from Peyton Manning in football when he, he talked about the defense. I've used the term scouting the defense with my clients a lot of, you know, everything that we do for whether it's a training plan, whether it's a nutrition plan, whether it's a journaling practice, those are all offensive schemes. Like those yes. are all things that you're putting into play in order to score a touchdown, but then life plays defense on you. And if you yes. don't, if you don't scout the defense, if you don't look at your plan and kind of go through the game tape, then you could be running the same play that worked before, but now all of a sudden life made adjustments on you and it's not working anymore. Well, you can keep hitting the line and trying to get a yard at a time, but you're going to exhaust yourself and then you're not moving in the right. same level anymore. But kind of going into that reflection, Greg, could you explain how you teach that? It's kind of like learning how you can watch game tape of what you did, but if you mm -hmm. don't know what you're looking for, you don't know how to make those adjustments. So how do you teach that reflection? So first, an interesting story about Peyton Manning, very quick, yeah. about him going into a bar somewhere at like the Pro Bowl or something like that with a bunch of defensive players picking up their tab and sitting down and going, you know that play where you broke to the outside instead of the inside mm -hmm. and you intercepted me? What, what the, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, go ahead. Yeah, it, well, it's funny with his, uh, with his story of that, I forgot to mention the point on that is he used to talk about give the defense quiet victories, not loud celebrations. Interesting. Yeah, Cause he would say, it's like the defenses in the NFL, they're, they're good enough that regardless of how good your plan is on offense, they're going to, they're going to mm -hmm. stop you at some points. He's like, but if you miss a third down and you have to punt it away or like you miss a ball, okay, that's fine. Give them their quiet victories, but fumbling the ball or making a mental error, like those are loud celebrations. Those are momentum shifters. And anybody who's an NFL fan, it comes down to one or, you know, two or three plays right. in the game. Right. That you give them those big things that you make those mental errors. Those are the loud celebrations. So he said, yeah, give them the quiet victories. That's fine. We can, we'll, at the end of the game, we're still going to be ahead. If we let that, I thought it was such an interesting way of using that into what we're trying to do and learn through life. Yeah. Yeah. Peyton was great at that for sure. And that's why it was so good. And that, and that's a great segue into what you were just asking. How do you teach the reflect piece, man? When I finally figured that out, when you see this, you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, it's so obvious. That's what I think too, mm -hmm. but you have to tell people about it. So for instance, if we were to use what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I, I do, I, I familiarize people with this. And I say, this is thinking about your thinking. Then I say, do whatever it is you want to do. I don't care how poorly you do it, mm -hmm. just do it. And then when they do the thing, whatever it is in, in the music world, that's playing a certain passage or something like that. And in, in your world, it would be some movement or some yeah. uh, mm -hmm. type of exercise. 
And they say, what was wrong? What was wrong with that? And guess what usually happens? I'm sure you know by now. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, let's go back again. Do it again. And this is where, and this is crucial, because the metacognition happens here. You have to be aware of what you're doing while you're doing it. And this is, we don't think, we just kind of do. And even if we reflect, we don't know what to reflect on because we didn't think while we were doing metacognition, thinking about your thinking and about your doing is actually what that word means. Um, mm. So then I say, and this is all planned. I know they're not going to have anything the first time. And I do this with little kids many times. Sure. Okay. Well then let's make a plan to do it again. But this time I want you to think really hard about what you're doing. Now, the caveat here is it will likely make you worse at it that you're thinking about it while yes. you're doing it because you'll be distracted. That's okay. Yes. Doesn't matter. We're, we're not working on your skill now. We're working on this skill. We're not working on your physical skill. So after mm. that, about the second time or third time, they start to go, well, wait a minute. You know, you showed me to do this with the kettlebell, but I noticed mm. I'm below my shoulder instead of at the mid-level of my yeah. shoulder. Oh, I didn't see that. And here's what starts to happen. You start to grow a mental model. And that's, that's what Erickson gets into in his later work. Like we need a mental model in our head to, uh, in order to prepare, in order, I'm sorry, in order to compare what we're doing. So if you want to do something well, you have to know what well is to get there. Yeah. Right? And you have to start discovering it on your own, which makes you focus on what your teacher is telling you. You want to take notes on everything they say, because I'm going to need to get home and find this stuff. So what happens is, when the reflect piece starts, you will find hardly anything. You'll have to think and think, maybe it was this. Okay, do it again. Now I want you to think while you're doing it. And you very slowly, it takes about 10 minutes, at least in, in my experience with uh, a lot of the people I work with, to start to get the reflect piece going. Then something magical starts to happen, not just in the moment, but over the course of weeks. Because they're able to solve more problems, and more importantly, because they're able to see more things, their mental model grows. And the more, this is a great quote from the book, mm. Learn it, uh, Make It Stick, the more you learn, the more you can learn. The, yes, the, yeah. The, the analogy I use is sitting down and watching a football game with my mom. Mm -hmm. Okay, Someone can go up to the line with three wides and, and a single high safety, and I'm like, okay, he's going to have someone open deep. You know, they're going to have to right. – it's a bunch of guys fighting over a ball. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the difference is, is that she doesn't care, and she, right. never, she never watched football to comprehend. I've been watching it for decades and listening to the announcers and listening, you know, back in the day, John Madden drawing up plays and explaining everything. And so I have a richer mental model. I can look at the same picture that she's looking at and I can get 50 things out of it where she'll get two. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens as you grow your mental model. The more you do this, the more your mental model grows. So as you get to the do and especially the reflect stage, you can see more and more and ever finer detail. Now, I do want to add this caveat. This is something that I've come to call the artist's curse. If you listen, and especially in music, um, if you listen to a great performer get off stage and say, these five things went totally wrong. You're like, I didn't even hear that. That was amazing. In fact, yeah. I remember seeing the great classical guitarist at Chicago Symphony Hall, John Williams. Um, he made one mistake in an entire, I, I, and he's renowned for being perfect. One, I, I knew where it was. It was coming out of a middle section in the Bach Chacon. And that's all he could talk about after the concert. Yeah. Was that one. But that's the artist's curse. The more you see that isn't going right. And, and we were talking earlier about how artistic expression is anything done at a high level. It doesn't matter right. what you're coaching. As you start to see more, you'll see how far you are from where you want to be. Yeah. This can be very discouraging because it never ends. As your, right. your mental model will always grow. Well, this is where uh, advances in the field come from. I mean, we've been talking about the NFL. Look at NFL players from 50 years ago. Right. And look at them now. They've constantly refined the shape that they're in, how they play the game, and it improves. This is where this leads as your mental model improves. Now, in competition, it's kind of easy to do that. You always have someone to compete against. You always you have an incentive because if you don't win, you get fired and that sort of stuff. But this, especially in art or anything where it's not a competition, it just never ends. So you have to kind of accept that for this week, this is good enough. 
Right. Yeah. Well, and kind of, we, I think we talked about it, you know, off air beforehand of like where that dopamine release is. It's like where, when you get to that level, you're probably, you're getting, you're actually enjoying that process. You're getting the dopamine release yes. on the process, not the result of it. I heard Anthony yes. from Red Hot Chili Peppers talk about this, where somebody was praising him like, oh my God, I saw your concert. It was freaking amazing. He's like, you saw us on a serious off day. Like all he was thinking about was everything that went wrong, you know, flea missed something here and, and so on and so forth. Because he's like, that's just how, you know, they are. And it's not that, you know, I mean, who knows, maybe, you know, maybe it's not as enjoyable for that one time, but it's how they learn. But what you brought up there about the process of the goal at that time is not to get better at the thing, it's to get better at the system. Yes. I think that is such an important point that I see where so often I think we get into things and we want to just get better at that. When if we don't have the system of how to actually improve on it, then yeah, maybe you might just from some random practice and some point, you'll feel a little bit of difference, but you're going to hit a ceiling really quickly. And then it goes back to, oh, I'm just not talented in this. It's like, no, I think maybe you just didn't learn the process of it as much. So that, you know, do reflect and plan of just going into it. That's, that's such a powerful point for people, you know, to use, get good at the system first, and then you'll get good at the thing. That's a fatal flaw for many people. They think, they always compare it, and I say you should have a mental model, and you should. You should know what it looks like. But this demands breaking it down into small parts. Yes. I want to be a great whatever. Okay, do it. <laughs> Whoa, there's about 1,500 parts here. Yeah. Plan. I better start with one of them. And then you start right. breaking that down into parts, that sort of thing. So it's it's a fatal flaw to want to be at the end before it, this is especially problematic in music because everyone thinks they should just pick up an instrument and kind of be able to play if I have talent. Right. It doesn't work that way. It's a completely new skill. You have to do things with your hands that human beings were not meant to do. Um, mm -hmm. You have to, it's an entirely new written language. It's an entirely new aural or ear language. And you have to somehow learn to do that and get really good at it. Otherwise you don't have talent, which very few people do. Those that do have some sort of experience before they get there. I can tell you my story, how I look talented in the beginning and I can easily see how, and all, and all talent is when you're learning is a slight, like this much advantage. And then people yeah. latch on to you. There's a great story about uh, uh, Jokovic, the tennis player. And he was out wherever, whatever country he was in. And his teacher was teaching groups of people. And she said, when he came back to the second lesson the next week, this was on 60 Minutes some years ago. When he came back, he was amazing. The way he held a racket was like nobody else. And it was only a second lesson. I knew then he was great. Well, what if you just went home and stood in front of a mirror a few times and did this? Right. That would put him at a great advantage to the other. And it's not that big of an advantage just to hold a racket well. Right. And yeah. this is particularly problematic with adults. There's a real problem with adults. If you taught kids and taught adults, adults get frustrated really quickly. And the reason for that, I believe, is that after at least 12 years of schooling, I'm in the U.S., so that's what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. After at least 12 years of schooling, we all have better skills than we realize in math, history, reading comprehension. We take for granted, ah, geez, I did okay. And then high school algebra. But are you kidding? That's pretty complex math up right. to that point. We've all learned to speak, which is highly complex and an improvisatory skill. We're all improvising at this high level. Then we decide we're going to take on something totally new that we know something about. And I think music and um, physical fitness have something in common here mm -hmm. because with music, it's, I'm going to learn a totally new, you know, this isn't like, well, I'm going to, I never really studied up on the Byzantine era in history. I'm going to study up on that. Well, you can already read. You already have a general conception as to how history works and right. what happened when you understand how to study history. You look at leaders, you look at social movements, all this sort of stuff. Then, and what I always use, the example I use is if you're an adult and you want to remodel your bathroom and you need to learn a few things about angles and how to cut a piece of wood and how to do tile, a couple of weeks of study will get you there because you have all of this foundational stuff underneath right. you that you don't realize you have. Then we try something like physical fitness or music and expect to be competent of it in the same competent at it in the same amount of time. Yes. Ah, it should take a couple of weeks. I'm smart. I'm not a five-year-old or seven-year-old. I could be. Yeah. And then we can't, and we we designate ourselves as untalented and give up. 
Yeah. But that's not it at all. It's a totally new thing. And when it comes to working out and stuff like that, it's a totally new physical skill. You've never had to, when you were learning math, you didn't have to watch yourself and figure out your technique and check everything yeah. you're doing your full extension, full reps and all this other stuff. So when adults tell themselves, ah, it should be easy. I can learn many, many skills. I can learn how to remodel my house a little bit. I can learn how to work on my car a little bit. I can do all these that I never studied before. And now all of a sudden, why is music so hard? Ah, it requires talent. Why is physical fitness so hard? Ah, I need physical talent. Yeah. Not that at all. Yeah. And that's, we see it a lot in, in the fitness world of the, the line of, well, I'll, I know what I need to do. I just need to do it. And it's like, well, not so much. I can kind of dive into that, you know, quite a bit more. So the there, key but. to that is small. You said this earlier is small victories. If you yes. do enough of this for five or 10 minutes, you'll start to be able to do, to do things you couldn't do before. Yeah. And then you, and then you have a very realistic position with the person to say, if you got that much better in 10 minutes, what's going to happen if you do this 10 minutes a day? Yeah. Well, and I love that too, because, and that's, you know, the world of, of kettlebell training that I'm in, like, I've seen that so many times when you're talking, like somebody does something, okay, like how'd that feel, where to go wrong, all right, try it this time. And then the next time they do it, it sucks even more because they're thinking about it so much right. in there. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. And then you get into it and then you build the process up of it. But it's, yeah, it's that, that concept of learning how to learn. I think with the brain too, it's interesting because, you know, with training, like if you go to the gym enough, if you're doing relatively right things, you're going to see a change. You'll feel mm -hmm. a change or so it's in the brain. Good. Well, in the brain, in the kind of a learning process, it's a little bit different timeline of what you're mm -hmm. doing. But this is just like, like anything that you do in the gym or learning an instrument. Like if you learn it in the right way of deliberate practice. And that reflection point, as you said, I think is such the big key that a lot of people miss. It's like, if you just do it, okay, you're going to get something done. It's better than nothing. But if you go back and reflect on it, that's when you can actually learn and you can continuously get better. And you do that enough, just a little bit, and you realize it works, then that's like the dopamine. Makes oh, you want to do more. Oh, shit. Exactly. Oh, shit. What else can I do? Oh, my God. This is so much fun, right? And so. it opens everything up. It blows yeah. your mind. You're like, wow, there's almost nothing I can't do. Yeah. Well, that and that's, I remember hearing that from, I think it was like, I think it was Tony Robbins, or it might have been Jack Canfield who talked about that of, you know, happiness is progress. It's not getting to the result. It's seeing progress. Yes. You know, and if you're doing that, and I think that's the key to learning and kind of going back into you know, the musicians who always see like the artist curse that you said, like always see the things fault. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, because they know they can always get better and they've adopted that. And it's, you can go really far of doing that, whether it's fitness, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, business, you know, entrepreneurship, yes. that's a huge thing. And yes. that as well, um, you know, just the concept of how you learn is just as important as all the things that you're doing to get to where you want to be. I think that's so fascinating. That is the thing you should be doing to get you where you want to be. Yeah. And every and I've said this many times, everything else doesn't work. You either do it and get good or you don't and you suck. Those are yeah. your two options and there's <laughs> nothing else. And however much you do it is how good you'll get. Yes. So mo the only way to learn something is deliberate practice. That's the only way. There is no other way. And we all do some of it or we'd learn nothing, yeah. but we do it haphazardly. We do it sometimes out of fear. We do it, you know, uh, sometimes out of self-preservation. I've got to pass this test. Mm -hmm. And you end up doing 10 minutes of the three hours of your studying is actually deliberate practice, but it was enough to get you through the test, probably more than 10 minutes. Yeah. But uh, because you don't know good memorization uh, strategies, we can memorize as much stuff as we want anytime we want. It's you just have to learn how to do it. And we think that it's kind of beyond us, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Um, Greg, dude, thank you so much for coming on. This has been absolutely awesome. I loved learning from you and hearing uh, all the work that you're doing. This is great. I think it's so important that we get into the, this piece of it for everybody, regardless of what you're doing. This is such important stuff for anybody who's trying to improve. So I really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. There needs to be a book. So I'm writing one. Awesome. Beautiful. Okay. What's the book called? I don't know yet. No, that's okay. not the title. Okay. <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> uh, still working with some titles, but I've had a lot of people suggest it to me. And I used to say, well, find me a publisher then. And they're like, no, 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 do it on your own. So I'm studying how to do a book. And I wrote a little manual for music, but I'm, I'm writing a general book. Within, within a short period of time, probably within a week of recording this, I will have something on my website to sign up for the introduction or first chapter, et cetera, et cetera. So Beautiful. And if, and if uh, people want to check that out, what is, what's your website? Where can they go to? GregGoodhart.com, G-R-E-G-G-G-O-O-D-H-A-R-T, I'm pretty, .com. Pretty sure some poor sap is missing a G in his name because I took all of them. <laughs> Like they, he's named Gary, but he's airy because I took all the G's. Oh man, that's great. So Greg, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, listeners, thank you so much. Catch you on the next one. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found some great value here. And if you like this episode, please drop a comment and leave us a five-star rating and review. It does more to build a show than you can imagine. And do not forget to check out and join the Strength Connection Facebook group. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations as as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. It's, this group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength and it's the perfect space to explore new ideas and to share your journey. And you'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into the physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. So do not wait, go now. Seriously, go. I right, much love to you, thank you so much, and I'll catch you on the next one.